Uh, yeah, I've been asked here to sort of introduce uh, maker communities, um, although that makes it sound a bit grand and formal. Um, there just are quite a lot of people who like making things, hacking things, tinkering with things, finding new uses for things, inventing things. Um, and, uh, and I've made things all my life, uh, since I was a very small child. Most recently, I've been making uh, coin-operated arcade machines. Um, I have my own arcade on this pier, which is about uh, 100 miles northeast of London. I don't know why it's shrunk to that funny size, but perhaps we'll leave it like that. Um, and this man's got his hand in a cage with a mad dog. Um, this is a sort of underwater adventure. You can see the chains going up to the ceiling. Um, it seats a whole family. Uh, so, and people really think it is going to go under the pier, but actually you just watch a video through a fish tank full of water, and it, and it wobbles about a bit. Uh, this one's fairly self-explanatory. <coughs> you can rent a dog. Um, uh, you take the dog for a walk on a treadmill, and uh, you have your view of the walk, and the dog has his own view of what he's interested in. <laughs> um, he's generating electricity to bring a sort of Frankenstein monster to life. And this is QuickFit. She's watching a Jane Fonda exercise video while the bed does the exercises for her. She's getting her foot treated. That's the chiropodist is treating her foot inside the treatment bay. And uh, this is the expressive photo booth that does things to you, like uh, suddenly dropping the seat before taking each photo to provoke different expressions. Uh, this is a three-minute package holiday. Um, you're just getting 30 seconds of suntan from a heat lamp at that point. And uh, this one is Mobility Masterclass, where you train for your future. You have to cross the motorway with a Zimmer frame or walker and see how you get on. <laughs> well, you can imagine it's um, satisfying for me to, uh, to go into my arcade and watch people enjoying themselves. Uh, it keeps me at it. I make at least one new machine for the arcade every year. Uh, and then, at the end of the week, I go and empty all the money as well. And uh, I split it 50-50 with the peer, but my half is still enough to live quite comfortably off. So I'm very, very lucky to be able to make a living at what I love doing. Um, <clears throat> but I used to feel quite isolated. I don't really fit in with any art world. Um, I, I don't, not interested in art theory. And really, I just make things to entertain people. Um, but equally, I don't really fit in with the engineering world either. Certainly, proper engineers think of me as a sort of eccentric artist, even though the machines have to be, comply with all the safety regulations and uh, have to be pretty robust. Some of them have been used 100,000 times. But even so, I don't quite fit there. But um, about 10 years ago, I was invited to speak at uh, the London Dorkbot. And um, this, there are dork bots now in cities all over the world. And this is really where I first met my first maker community. Uh, dork bots are defined as people doing strange things with electricity. Um, and they're just a great bunch of kindred spirits. Uh, they're passionately interested in technology, like me, and don't take themselves too seriously. And that's just perfect, really. Um, and. Uh, the door, London one, and they've, they've been op more have been opening in England all the time. Uh, more recently, uh, hack spaces have opened up. This one's in Hackney. Um, and the hack spaces are slightly different. The members uh, group together to rent a space that they go to to do their projects in. Uh, there's a particularly good one in Nottingham um, where they've built their own 3D printer and CNC um, machining tool. And um, they even have their own health and safety machine. <laughs> <laughs> but really, it's, the community is very small in this country. It's much bigger in the America. 
uh, there's a very successful magazine on the West Coast called Make. Um, and Make is a mixture of uh, articles about people who make things, but also projects of things that you can make yourself. Um, I'm not quite sure what bit of electronics is inside the tin, but something audio, I think. Uh, and, I, and I don't know whether this is a cat flap or quite what it is, but that's vaguely the sort of thing that you can make with their projects. Uh, the magazine has been so successful that it's spawned maker fairs, uh, and makers bring much larger things to show off to people, to the fairs. Um, you notice the spaceship in the background of that one. Um, and this house is actually uh, on wheels and is steam-powered. In the Bay Area, the maker fairs have linked with an existing community of people who made amazing things for the Burning Man Festival in the desert, um, which adds to a sort of critical mass of uh, people making extraordinary things. I don't know if you can see, but these are real trucks. There's full-size trucks. Um, and uh, I work with the, the Exploratorium, the Science Center in San Francisco, and they now have open make weekends once a month. And again, people bring things to show off and look at what other people have made. And there are also workshops where you can try, in this case, a printing press, or I was trying to get kids to use a spot welder when I was there in March. And while I was there, um, this place opened in downtown San Francisco called Tech Shop. This is a huge building. Um, and it's run like a gym. You pay a monthly subscription, and then you can get to use all their machine tools. You get taught how to use them, and then you book time on them. Well, the people in these maker communities, there are a lot of men. There are an awful lot of software engineers who want to do something more tangible in their spare time. There are girls as well. Um, but there are also families. Because um, kids really don't make very much at school anymore. There's such pressure on schools to... Uh, perform well academically, that the practical things have rather gone by the board. When I go into schools, I'm both shocked how bad kids are at using simple things like pliers and um, scissors, because they just don't do it much at home, um, but also delighted that there are always some kids who really get enthusiastic about it. And it's often kids who do badly at school, who just aren't really suited to academic stuff. Um, this is my workshop. I spend most of my life in here. And the one thing about makers is we do spend most of our lives in our workshops. We're not the most sociable of people, and we're not great networkers. So the web has been wonderful for us, because it makes it much easier to see what other people are doing and to post things about what we're doing ourselves. Um, and also, there's this whole very much part of it is sharing uh, your trade, your secrets, or how you make things with anybody who wants to know anything, you let them know, uh, which is very much the same, I think, as the open source movement. But it's, uh, it is quite a contrast with making physical things, to how things were before with, company, with companies with their trade secrets and craftsmen keeping things secret. Uh, a good example of this is the Arduino. Um, which you probably know about. It's an open source microcontroller. And there's just so much stuff online about it that you can find the code for almost any project you want to do. Uh, and if you get stuck, you can post a question. And um, uh, in my case, it got the, both questions asked, got to answered within two minutes. Well, um, the final thing I wanted to say about the maker movement. Uh, I, I make things because I enjoy it, and uh, I think most people just do it for fun. But I think there is a bigger idea behind it. Um, a long time ago, I did a theoretical engineering degree. Uh, it was all hard sums, and I enjoyed the sums. I was quite good at them. But now I'm making my arcade machines. I realize that the sums aren't really very relevant to what I make, or aren't really relevant at all. And an awful lot of engineering design really rem remains an art. And when I'm in my workshop, sometimes I'm very distracted by, oh, people who've come to visit or something that's churning around in my head. And sometimes in my hands almost, I can make a part without hardly any conscious thought. My hands almost seem to take over. It's as if the brain's, my brain is in the tips of my fingers. Um, and I, I, I marvel at this. I think it's amazing. But actually, I'm not sure it's so surprising. Um, if you look at our evolution, uh, the first apes that stood on two legs, that's about 3.7 million years ago, this is Lucy, um, 
had a brain that was uh, three times smaller than ours. So in th just over three million years, our brains have mushroomed three times. So something very powerful must be driving this n rapid expansion. And it must, it's more than a coincidence that it starts when we stand up. And so I think it's sort of reasonable, that at least to some extent, it must be the enormous potential for hand-eye-brain coordination. We do simple things like catch a ball that um, the most sophisticated robots have real trouble doing. So I just think this, uh, where our brains are sort of hardwired for tinkering, thinking with our hands. Uh, and because we're so, they're so exquisitely tuned for this sort of thing, um, it's a shame, it, you know, it, it, that's why it's so satisfying to do it, and it's a shame not to make use of what we can do with our brains. Thank you. <laughs>